Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening. Liam Hartree here today with another episode of Presenting Champions for the Simply Inspired channel. Today joined by a very, very special guest. I'm truly honoured uh, to have her on the show. Today's guest, Natalie Powell, um, judoka, who is has such a long list of accomplishments, I actually don't know where to start, but some of the highlights um, of this two-time Olympian, uh, former world rank number one, world middle Europeans and masters medalist, Commonwealth Games champion, uh, the amount of medals she's won, I'd be here all day, uh, absolutely tremendous athlete and uh, remarkable person as well. So Natalie, thank you very much for coming on the show and it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on and thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I mean, it's a funny thing. I was looking at, at everything that you've achieved, and I was thinking, gosh, how do I how do I break this down into a, you know, into a sort of small enough category? So hopefully, I've done that justice um, because there is there is a lot there. Um, so getting into it from the beginning, I think that that's actually a good place to start. Really, I mean, with everything that you have accomplished um, in your career so far, and obviously there's there's more to come. Do you have particular medals or particular wins that you're most proud of or that are um, perhaps more meaningful to you? Because I was curious to get your thoughts on this, of having accomplished so much, you, you keep obviously motivating yourself to get better and better and to win more. But when you do take the time to look back, are there certain, certain wins, certain medals, certain tournaments that stand out as being your personal favourite achievements, if, if you get where I'm going with this? Yeah, I think I've got a lot of favourite ones, to be honest, just for different reasons, I think. Um, winning the Commonwealth Games in 2014 was um, really special for me because it was a childhood dream of mine to go to the Commonwealth and, and win it. So, um, yeah, to win the final against the current Olympic silver medalist as well, that kind of really started my career um, in terms of the IGF tour and really world level judo. So, yeah, I've got really fond memories of, of that. Um, and then in terms of... Um, yeah, I've got quite a few actually. I think when I got my uh, world medal was really special because, um, yeah, my coach Dan Warner was there and Kate Howie was in my chair and my mum and dad came out to watch it as well in, in Budapest. Um, so to have all those people there on the day that I um, um, won the world medal, that was that was really special. And I'm going to keep going on here, I think. <laughs> and then um, there's a couple of Grand Prix I won, one in Tel Aviv and one in Croatia recently this year. And um, for both my coach, because he can't always come out to the competitions and sit in the chair. Um, and he was there for both of them. And I just had a really good day. It was just a nice feeling. I had some of my support team there and beat a few girls on both occasions I hadn't beat before. Um, and it was just a really nice day. And it, yeah, I just really enjoyed both of those. Those Were they Grand Prix? Yeah, Grand Prix they were. Um, so yeah, those are probably some of my standout moments, really. Oh, and then when I got to world number one, that was also... That was one of my favourite memories because I um, won the Abu Dhabi Grand Slam in order to get the world number one. And yeah, that was always a dream of mine to get to the ranking list as well. So yeah, there's a few just for different reasons, really. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, I was just curious out of so many, you know, how you would uh, how you choose certain specific ones. Now, you touched on something there about uh, the Commonwealth Games being a sort of a childhood dream. And, and forgive me, I, I don't always do these interviews in, in linear time, by the way. I should have I should have mentioned that. So we might jump around a little bit um, because it's, it's all about the, uh, the inspirational side of things. Um, you mentioned that being a childhood dream. So when you were um, growing up and you were sort of progressing in your judo career, how did you build the belief that obviously you would get to the level that you are now. I know this is slightly an abstract, but I think it's very useful for a lot of um, sort of up and coming athletes out there or, you know, people who have in mind that I want to achieve um, whatever. So almost like if you're talking to yourself, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, however long it is, what would be, what, at that time, how did you build the belief that you would get to the level you are now if you again if you get where i'm going with that uh, it's, it's very difficult to say really because i think when i was younger um i always loved the olympics and the commonwealth games when they're on tv to be honest i probably didn't even know the difference of them too much look like, there's lots of people doing sport and i love sport and i love watching it um and i think because we had um, judo players from the club um go and get commonwealth games medals gary cole he got a bronze in the manchester games so i think since i saw him do that Commonwealth Games medal was always seemed like something was realistic because I knew somebody had done it and he was a really good junior player and we always looked up to him in the club. 
Um, but in terms of actually setting those top goals, you know, like getting a world medal or European medal, I never set those goals. Um, I kind of just gradually started getting better. And then I got a European cup medal and I was like, oh, I feel like I could quit judo now. I've achieved like something that I never thought I would achieve. And then suddenly I'd achieve the next level up and the next level. And then, yeah, it just kind of kept chipping away before I realized, um, yeah, I never really set, oh, I really want to get a European medal. I really want to get, I just kept getting, trying to get better and just kept improving my flaws. And I was really lucky that um, I met um, my coach, Darren Warner, who just managed to instill a lot of belief in me in terms of the way he runs training programs. And yeah, he made me do training sessions. I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to get through that. That is way too hard. I can't do that possibly. Like I never said it out loud, but in my head, I was thinking I'm not getting through this. And then suddenly I would have got through it and I'm like, oh, and then you start to believe in yourself. You start to think, oh, maybe I can do this. I am, I am that fit. And then you start beating a few players that you, you hadn't beaten before. And yeah, your belief starts to, starts to build. Um, but it wasn't necessarily a conscious effort for me. It was more that I was very fortunate that I had a good coach that was doing the right things in order to instill the belief in me, I would say. It's fascinating because so many um, elite athletes I've spoken to actually say that, that, that it's not about a specific goal, but the process of, well, and that's it, enjoying the process, um, you know, level by level and getting better step at a time actually leads to... Um, the greater results. I find that a fascinating commonality. I mean, that's not a question. I'm just saying it. I find that a fascinating commonality between. Um, yeah, it's actually of... funny because when I think now, oh, yeah, I really want to get a world medal. I really want to get an Olympic medal. I haven't done them since I've said I really that is my goal. Whereas when they weren't my goals, I seem to be chipping off things, and it was like a pleasant surprise. Um, maybe I need to go back to that. Stop setting goals and just go with the flow a little bit more. Possibly. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's just something I've seen and heard so much of actually the people who've won the most um, in, in different sports I've interviewed. That, that, that is a common theme of sort of enjoying the process and not, not making it too specific. So it's, I think there's definitely something in that. And obviously surrounding yourself with, um, with success and, and the right people. That's an important lesson. So our audience, listen up. This is, this is gold dust so far. It's brilliant. <laughs> Um, another thing, obviously, following on from that with the, the process is, is obviously you have consistently um, competed at the highest level for, for a long time. And I'm curious to get into, because what I'm trying to do is, is get into certain aspects people don't see from the outside, you know, and, and from looking in. So when it comes to um, mentally preparing for competitions and things like that, I mean, obviously, it's, it's a physical thing, you know, at the end of the day, it's a very very tough sport, very, very skilled sport as well. Um, but I'm curious to get into like what what is going through your mind on the build up to an important tournament. So for example, you mentioned you have um, something tomorrow and, and you know you're obviously quite used to being on the build up to these things. And I think that something a lot of people would be curious to know about is basically how you feel, I mean if you're sort of visualizing, you know, how you handle nerves if they come, I mean you might not feel them because of how long you've been doing this. You know, those very human aspects of things that people go through when they're doing anything important. How do you um, handle that and keep yourself in, in sort of a positive space? Yeah. I think that's kind of an ongoing thing. And I think from, depending on where you are in your personal life or your training life, it's an ongoing battle, I think. I, I always have nerves on competition day. And I think uh, the day I don't have nerves is probably the day it's time to give up because it probably means I really don't care anymore. But in terms of managing them, I find the best strategy I've found is to is my perception of those nerves. Um, um, earlier on in my career, there would be numerous times where they would completely take over me and my legs would go to jelly and I literally couldn't function on the mat. Um, but as I've yeah got more experience, I'm, when, I, when I experience the nerves, I channel them into like more of a positive energy and just be excited to be out there and see it as a, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to, yeah, to achieve something um, and enjoy um because it's easy to think oh i've got all this to lose now if i lose this now um and then that just cripples you um and don't get me wrong it's not just as easy as just saying those things to yourself um but i feel like if i can nip it in the bud early when i start to get the first sign of those feelings and start reframing my thought patterns um yeah more often than not i can get myself into a good place these days but then you've obviously got those extreme situations like when you're in the olympics or the things that really matter the very most to you um they always a little bit more of a more of a challenge um but yeah i think i'm constantly adapting the way i um think and yeah uh, channel the nerves or the 
the energy really. Um, yeah, it's very different from when I was, yeah, starting out really. And you've grown into it. I mean, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's a valuable lesson because, you know, with that, people can take that and people listening to this and they can apply that to any, um, any life area that it's important, whether it's sports or, or whether it's something else. So it's, it's quite a valuable lesson because obviously when you're at your level, people look up to you and, and, and rightly so, they should. But it also sh sort of shows people that even people at your level, they're not above those things. I mean, it's still a, a growth process of going through that. Um, I think a lot of people don't actually realise that, which is my reason for, for asking. Yeah, 100% um, no, true. You go through all the emotions, everyone. You doubt yourself. You, Yeah, am I, am I good enough? Am I, yeah, it's just, I mean... I assume every athlete has this, these thoughts. I don't know, maybe this, the, the Roger Federer's of the world and the Djokovic's maybe, I don't know. But um, yeah, I definitely have normal thoughts. Yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly everyone I've personally been around, whether it's interviewing like this or whether it's people I've worked with in my media, you meet people like Tyson Fury and people like who are really famous and that, that, they all say, whether they admit to it is a different thing, but you know when you're around them in, in training camps or before competitions, that it is it is going on it's just a case of whether they whether they actually say oh yes you know i felt that or whether they just say oh no i mean i don't feel any of that and they, and they sort of go down that road you know but it, you can still tell it's there you know so, game, isn't it? your head controls everything at the end of the day and if you don't train your mind how do you expect your body to function at the highest level i i genuinely feel at the top level between the top 10 in the world in in my weight category i don't think there's that much difference between um physicality we're all the same weight We've all done similar years of experience and stuff. What dif the difference on the day is that mentality. Um, I'd put it down to quite a large part of it, I would say probably, yeah, maybe 70%, I would say, is down to mentality and how you control your, your mind on that day. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen that as well, um, even just from, just from being around it in the media aspect. You can often tell who's going to win and who's going to do well by the sort of the way they project themselves, yeah. um, by how they will. I don't know, yeah. you can almost... Um, and you, you've had, well, I've had more experience with these elite competitions. It's almost a tangible thing. Mm. Um, so I, I just that's why I find that so fascinating to get into because it's there and it's tangible, but people just overlook it. Obviously, you have to put the physical, uh, physical work in, which also I think will be of interest to people as well in, in terms of your general training. And I know this is um, sort of a bit simple for you because it's, it's what you do all the time. But at the same time, people from the outside looking in, they don't see. You're not the work that goes in, they see the competitions um, themselves. Other athletes will know, obviously, the dedication and the sacrifices and the risks and so on. In terms of your training, can you walk us through um, what an average day is like in the life of an elite martial artist, essentially? Um, that's, that's the question. Well, it's very varied depending on phase you're in. Um, yeah, probably as you maybe, I don't know, We te I tend to work on kind of blocks. So say three months out from major competition, there'll be a bit more volume, a lot longer sessions, working more on technical and physical aspects and yeah, strength endurance. And um, and then as you come closer to the competition, I tend to sharpen up more and do more explosive power-based stuff. And that's, yeah, transferred through both the judo sessions and the weights and conditioning. Um, but yeah, a general day is probably two sessions a day, um, maybe four randori sessions a week, which is fighting practice for about an hour and a half. Um, each evening um, I'll probably do maybe three technical sessions throughout the week for about an hour each time and then two conditionings and between two and four weight sessions depending on what sort of block you're in all about an hour and a half I would say um, yeah if I'm in a hypertrophy phase it'll probably be four if I'm in a explosive phase before before competitions maybe two so yeah it's all very um, block dependent but that's the general general gist of it yeah, general overview. It is fascinating. I mean, it's like, obviously for you, it's it's um, it's what you do all the time. But I still think that it's really interesting because as other athletes all, all know to some degree, depending on, on what sport they're in. But uh, but in terms of fans and people who watch competition, I mean, they, they don't know. So it's it's really good to get into that. Now, another slightly more nitty gritty um, sports question before we go a little bit to some of the deeper um, deeper things. Obviously, um, I asked you earlier about the proudest moments and things like that. One question that always comes up that I get asked to ask, if you like, by popular demand, is about people's sort of toughest competitions. People seem to like uh, hearing about the ones that, that were 
almost a struggle to, to overcome, but you, you got there in the end type of thing. And obviously, this is quite a big question because this is not always just what happens in the competition. A lot of times I ask this, and it can be things going on outside of that in people's lives, and they sort of have to focus through that. So I, I, I appreciate it's a big question, my apologies. But in terms of when you think back and you think of the um, some of the toughest um, competitions, toughest matches you've been in, um, and how you sort of overcame that, it's, as I mentioned, it's something I get asked a lot. So big question, I'm sorry, but in your own words on that one, please. Um, I don't think I can put it down to one, oh, there was one competition, oh, there was one actually. So I really struggled with my sexuality for a long time, and um, I channeled everything in studio as a massive distraction from it basically and yeah i lost a lot of energy by yeah just thinking about yeah having thoughts about my sexuality and then just having it all in studio and there was a competition i think it was after i'd come out actually in zagreb i want to say and i was just a wreck i was up all night the night before crying and couldn't control myself couldn't get myself together for the competition in the morning um I think I won my first contest by some miracle. I have no idea how it happened. <laughs> and then I lost my second one. And then there was like a break. And I was just an absolute wreck, but nobody knew why I was upset. Or So I was kind of trying to cover it up from everybody else. But um, I told my coach that there was something wrong, but I wasn't ready to speak to her about it then. And I said, we'd discuss it after the competition on the way back. And I was really lucky, actually, that my friend Megs was there um, on the trip and she knew what, what I was going through the night before and stuff. And, yeah, she spoke to me in the break before the final block um, and managed to get me back on track. And yeah, it was a long two hours, but I was very lucky that she, um, yeah, she talked me back in and I actually managed to win that bronze medal. Um, and yeah, I don't even know how it happened. I was absolutely emotional wreck. Um, but yeah, that was probably um, one of the toughest competitions I've, I've experienced in my career, I think. Mm. It's amazing, and it's it's amazing how you uh, how you overcame that. I mean, I know it's, it's a very broad question as well, but um, no, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's it's it is fascinating what happens behind the scenes. Um, another thing, obviously, you mentioned the whole sexuality thing, and I I, I had questions about that, but I, I don't want you to think I'm sort of prying or to, you know getting into anything that's okay. because every question I ask is is you know it's quite a purpose. It's not just because of something but yeah obviously that must have been um, a difficult process I read an article when I was preparing for this interview uh, that you gave about how you know the many years of I think you said many years of pain that you went through um, and, the, and the release of finally telling people and um, obviously the transition to the life as it is now being yourself which is, is a wonderful wonderful thing I've got to say can you share with us a little bit about that process that you went through in terms of um, well, in terms of the transition, I mean, it's the only way I can say to put it off having this all bottled up to letting it out and, and sort of loving yourself for who you are. Or, I mean, again, I'm not sure of, of the process you went through. And, um, it's a funny question to ask because I don't, I don't think people are defined by any one thing. I mean, obviously, you're um, an elite athlete, but you probably have hobbies and interests that are totally different to that. You probably have all sorts of other things. So with the whole sexuality thing, it's not a, it's not a pigeonhole. I just thought that in very simple terms, um, there's probably people out there, well, there definitely are people out there going through the same thing even now. So obviously you sharing your journey helps them and, and it's as simple as that, that's my only reason for, yeah, for asking. Yeah, that's the only reason I, yeah, I feel like it's important to talk around it because like you say, it shouldn't define you or, um, but yeah, if there's people struggling and it helps to listen to somebody else's story, then I think that's something that sh should be out there, I suppose. Because um, I know listening to other people really helped me. Um, but it's really hard to do it in a short, um, let me think concisely. Um, yeah, for, I was, yeah, I really struggled with it for a long time and I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be gay and the thought of, like, it took me a long time to even accept it myself. Um, and I think maybe I accepted it when I was about 24, maybe a couple of years before Rio. Oh, was I 24 in Rio, 2016? Yeah, a couple of years before Rio, about 2014, I probably accepted myself and I thought, okay, I don't have to act on this, I'll just, concentrate on judo, channel everything into that. Um, I remember my thoughts before bed, I really started to sleep in a lot. Um, and I would just train myself just to think about my opponents and how I was going to beat them. And everything just become all about judo, um, which was very intense. Even when I stepped on the mat, 
like I would say to myself when I started getting nervous, I was like, oh, what's the worst thing you can, what's the worst thing that can happen? You, okay, you die. That's, that's the worst thing. And then just get a release of like stress and I'd go out. And if I said that to myself now, when I step in the bath, it just be, it would have literally no effect whatsoever. Um, Cause yeah, that doesn't seem like the, yeah, how intense it was then. It just, it was a whole different intensity. Um, and then two years in the lead up to Rio, in Rio, it was all on my mind all the time. I was worried about, you know, when you have interviews and they say, oh, who's your celebrity crush? Um, um, like I'd overthink these sort of questions so much in my head and think, okay, I'm just gonna say David Beckham. Okay, that's a safe answer. Like, yeah, because I never wanted to lie because I find David Beckham an attractive man, you know? Um, but um, yeah, those sort of questions in the media finding out that I was gay, just, yeah, that would have been the worst thing ever for me at that point. But after Rio, I was just, yeah, not in a good place mentally. and. I knew that if I didn't come to terms with this and um, I wasn't going to be able to progress in judo either. I needed to get it off my chest before Tokyo came around if I was to have any chance of um, getting on the podium. Um, and then I think it was the end of 2017 potentially. Um, I got to world number one and I got a world medal and I was probably the saddest I've ever been. Um, and I yeah, I knew then, like everyone says, the medals aren't going to make you happy or achieving what you, you're going to achieve isn't going to make you happy. But it's so true. <laughs> um, and I think until you realise it yourself, um, you're not ready to act on people's advice or experiences. Um, so I just broke down really at that point. Um, and I was sharing a flat with a friend in Warsaw and um, she knew there was something up for months before because I was just a shell of a person. Really. I'd lost loads of weight. Um, and yeah one day I broke down crying and she was like come on you've got to tell me what it is now and then I told her and then she was extremely supportive and really helped me through that period and I mean within six months I told all my friends and family everybody knew and I just felt like a massive weight had been released off my shoulders and yeah just felt like a new person and yeah I don't think I've had any bad reaction or any my friends and family I knew they wouldn't care anyway but I was still super scared to tell them or I just felt like as soon as I tell one person, then it's like they're going to tell somebody else. Or if I tell my mum, I have to tell my dad. Or if I tell my one sister, I need to tell the other sister. And then before you think, you're like, oh, I've got to tell five people in one go. And I'm like, oh, that seems so much more intense than just telling one. Um, but yeah, it was definitely the best thing I ever did. But then it's funny, isn't it? Because also after you've done that, um, then I just started questioning everything. I was like, is my whole life judo? Because I've just done it as an escape from life, really. And then for a while I was, yeah, doubting even if I wanted to do judo anymore or if it was still my passion or I'd lost the fire a little bit. It didn't seem like the end of the world if I lost anymore. Um, so yeah, it was a, a weird transition even after that. Um, but yeah, I'm in a really good place now and <laughs> I'm happy that I finally come to terms with it. So I think that's a, a whistle stop tour of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it is one of those things where I mean, how do you put all all the years of emotion and the, you know, the um, highs and the lows and all the different the different spectrum of feelings into into a short description? But um, but thank you for for sharing it because it it is actually um, it might sound strange, but it's, but it's a beautiful thing seeing how how happy you seem now just talking to you and coming out. And as I mentioned, I mean, I I don't. Um, think anything like this defines people it's just that like I said to you before if there's other people going in there um, going out there going through this process struggling then you know your story helps them and it, it is as simple as that really um, and it shows people what's possible so thank you for sharing that because I know obviously it is personal and it is um, well I still think it's brave to, to sort of speak about your, your personal life um, whatever it is in your personal life it's, it's a brave thing to do so um, so thank you you know um, so obviously um, one of the things, that we, throughout this talk we've sort of touched on things that are in one way or another, they are advice, they are life lessons that people can learn to um, use in their own lives in whatever they want to do, whether it's sports or whether it's something else. And, that, and that's really a big part of what I aim for with these talks. So we've, we've sort of touched on that going through this process, but if I were to sort of hone in on that a little bit more directly, say you had to give advice to somebody who... Um, they, well, they want to achieve a, a big goal, a big dream. Now, I know you, you said at the beginning, you know, you didn't necessarily aim for those those big things and it was a process. 
Um, and I also I appreciate that, that every person is, is, a, is a little different. But if there was some broad advice um, that you'd give with you know, reaching the level that, that you've reached and reaching it in such a way where obviously you've competed, you know, when there's times when you were happy, there's times when you were obviously very unhappy and you were still, you know, you were still doing it and there, there's a whole spectrum of, um, of things. What would you say to somebody, simply put, if, like if there's someone watching this or listening to this who comes to you and they say, okay, you know, I want to do something, um, and if it's something that's genuinely their dream, you know, not just something that to, to be cool or because they think they have to or whatever, but something that inspires them, even if it's niche or even if it's whatever. What would you say those people have to do? I mean, I know this is a big one, but um, what would you say as the essential ingredients for that, you know? Well, I think you never know how much you can achieve until you start. Um, so I think I would avoid looking at the big picture and just focus each day on trying to make yourself gradually better every day, doing something every day that's making you a little bit a bit better in those areas. Because, yeah, if you're focusing on the process and you've got short term goals, you look back after a year and look how far you've come. That's really inspiring and motivating. And then do it for another year. And then before you know it, you look back and like, oh, wow, I've come come a long way here. And just keep doing that. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Just have you, yourself as the benchmark because I think it's far too often people start looking at other people and think, oh, I need to be as good as them now. Oh, they're this age. Oh, they've done this, they've done this. Those sort of thoughts just swamp you and make you feel like it's never achievable and are really demotivating. I think you can always be better than you were the day before. So if you've only got yourself as the gauge, I think that's the thing that I've had to train on my own quite a lot in Cardiff because um, I'm the only um, athlete on the, the world tour at the moment, or I have been for a yeah, my, pretty much my whole career. I haven't had a lot of athletes around me to compete against regularly. So I've always had to just compete against myself. Um, and then sometimes now when I get in, put into group situations, it's all a bit overwhelming. I'm like, oh, oh, this competition here now. I need to, yeah, try and do better than them. Or, but actually, if you just try to do better than yourself all the time, that's the, that's the main thing, really. Well, that's a powerful lesson, actually. I mean, it's, it really is. I, I'm not just saying that. I mean, that's... I think it's something that people really need to hear, especially in this day and age with, um, personally, I think obviously social media and things like that, it breeds comparison and it breeds a false comparison to um, obviously not seeing the whole of a person's um, life. And um, yeah, competing against yourself, being better, um, because we all start from different points as well. So, you know, you, you know how far you've come um, from that point. And um, it's that's, that's really, really good advice, I think, actually, for people's a lot of people want fast wins these days and there is no fast wins in life really is there no. it's a long no. process to get anywhere that's worth going so yeah i think um social media is yeah not ideal in that sense there's a lot of misinformation and making you think that people are doing a lot better than what they really are um so yeah i think it's really important to just focus on focusing on yourself mm. Yeah, that's it. I mean, obviously, social media, it has its good points as well. But I definitely think the comparison thing is, is a real downer. And um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's powerful advice. And again, it's, it's advice that people can use in any aspect of life as well, um, of what they're achieving. So brilliant. So I think one of the last things to, to get into here, because we've, you know, we've touched on a few different things. And obviously, there, there's always more we could get into. But it's, um, hopefully, it's, it's a little different than, than the average, um, average interview. But in terms of your future plans, I mean, you mentioned obviously tomorrow you've got competition here, and we obviously we've spent a fair bit of time talking about goals and um, sort of taking things a step at a time. So, in terms of this, obviously it's a process you've been through where you mentioned at a point in time you were questioning if you wanted to continue in judo. You've obviously decided you you do want to continue in that. So, what what is lighting your fire now? I mean, obviously you've won so much, you've achieved so much. But you clearly still have a desire to um, reach a higher level again, or keep enjoying that process of, of getting better and better. But um, yeah, what what are your dreams and goals from here? I think is the simplest way to, to put that. Well, I still love judo, and I I enjoy training, and I enjoy the lifestyle. Um, I think in the lead up to Tokyo with COVID, everything got just a bit too intense. Uh, it was pretty much just training and there was I didn't have a very good balance in my life I think I probably overtrained a little bit in the lead up because I'm not having the normal traveling around the country or seeing your friends and family um and I probably burnt out a little bit after it um uh so I think my focus now is to just enjoy judo again get balance back in my life 
I'd love to get an Olympic medal. Um, it's the one that's missing from my collection. And obviously to do that, I'm gonna have to wait another 18 months. And there's a long qualifying process in that time. Um, so I'm trying not to look too much. That is the ultimate goal is to get an Olympic medal in Paris. Um, but with a lifestyle that's balanced and I'm enjoying each competition, enjoying the training, enjoying friend time with friends and family and just keeping my motivation up. Um, I'm an older athlete now, so I can't do the, the training volume I used to, but I, don't, I also don't need to do the volume I used to do. Um, and I've got time to do other things um, around judo, like going into schools that I'm hoping to do now and start um, increasing the participation in Welsh judo. Um, and just trying to do some little side projects along, maybe a little bit of coaching and um, yeah, set myself up in a position that when Paris finishes, whatever the outcome, I'm going to be ready to transition to the next stage of my life. Um, yeah, hopefully smoothly, but not too much downers or, or sad times. Yeah, amazing. Well, obviously, um, personally, I'd like to wish you best of luck for your future. Um, I mean, you know, there, there's some, still some exciting competitions out there, but obviously after that time uh, and after um, winning an Olympic medal, which, you know, I believe you, you will do, um, transitioning into the cultural role and, or whatever and sort of giving back and that sort of thing. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing um, as well, you know, and it's uh, funny enough, it's something we've, we've sort of touched on today because I've been asking for your advice about different things and, uh, and it's, it's, that'll be lovely. So I'd like to say um, a big thank you for your time, especially taking the time um, before competition and, you know, around everything you're doing. I appreciate that a lot. Um, Oh, one, one actually last thing before we close up is I always, I usually close up just by saying, are there any thank yous that you'd like to give? Because you mentioned your, your coach earlier, um, but I, I like to, I like to do this actually just to, just to close out because obviously no person is an island at the end of the day. And, um, you know, it's funny, we were just talking about competing against yourself, but obviously there's still people out there who helped you and contributed. There's obviously um, fans and supporters. I mean, I don't know how much of that you get on, funny enough, on social media, we talk about that as well, with people encouraging you, but anyone out there really, friends, family, I'm sure they know who they are, but anyone you'd like to thank, um, that's really the last question for for the afternoon. It's a massive amount of people probably, um, I'm probably going to miss people out if I go into individuals. Mm, sorry, Darren, I yeah, I mean, Darren Warner, he knows he's changed my career uh, massively for the better, but yeah, I couldn't have got anywhere without him. Um, all the support at Sport Wales, um, the support team I've had around myself, around me with the s &C, the conditioning, the physiologists, yeah, in the lead up to both games, they've been, yeah, incredible. British Judo have supported me a lot um, during the earlier part of my career and continue to do so in the major events. Um, my family and friends have just, yeah, I have the best family and friends, so, um, yeah, without going into individual names because I don't want to miss anyone out, um, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people, and like you say, I can't do any of this without the people around me. Um, yeah, it just just wouldn't be possible. So, yeah, very lucky person. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's just a little something I like to do because um, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people doing things behind the scenes um, in, in a lot of people's careers, whether that's obviously on the professional side or whether that's in people's sort of personal um, situations. There's a lot of people doing things behind the scenes, so. I'd like to give them a little shout out, but no, once again, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's honestly, it's been a pleasure. I think there's some real inspiration in here for, for people that will help people and um, you know, they can learn from and sort of grow from listening to this. I mean, that's my aim at the end of the day. Um, and I appreciate you just taking the time and I appreciate you being such an open book as well. I have to put that in there because um, obviously we've gone deep with some things. So thank you for sharing everything you've shared. No problem. Thank you for having me on. Thank you very much for watching um, please subscribe to the simply inspired youtube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon